I'll go get you. I'll get one for you. I'll get one. With that, I'm excited to uh, announce uh, or introduce our speaker today, Cheryl Powers with Jord Producers. Um, I've been after her for a while to come present just because I was so fascinated by the company and what they do, and I wanted to hear about the whys and the everything else. So I'm really going to be fascinated with her presentation today. I did try the mealworms. She's right, they taste like Chex Mix. And, you know, I feel a new energy and stuff, so I really think if you haven't tried them, you better go back and have a cup. So with that, Cheryl, thank you for being here. Thank you. Do I need to stay in this parameter? No. Okay. I just want to make sure. So my name is Cheryl Powers, and the reason I asked that is I spent 20 years as a public school educator, and then five years as a private college recruiter, and then I decided I was... I didn't know what I want to be when I grew up, but I knew I did not want to be confined to an office space anymore. And so I grew up on a farm, and I keep going back to our family farm, and I just kept filling a pole to get back into agriculture. And I knew that I'm too old to be running away from cows protecting their calves, and I don't want to be working with hogs anymore. And so it's like, what can I do that is agriculture related, but is something that is new and so it was kind of a natural flow for me to look at the insect agriculture world. A um, couple years ago Bug Eater Foods out of Lincoln, uh, they were you know they use cricket protein for products and so I was following them and I thought about doing crickets and then life kind of took me to Arizona and back and so um, long story short you know you have a, something that kind of irritates you a little more, crickets irritate me more for whatever reason. They jump on you, they come from section C and can land on you. Our, you know, our mealworms and beetles, they stay put. And so that was something that appealed to me, so that is why. Um, so I actually, being a teacher, I have show and tell here, and so I'm gonna be passing around containers, and there's a label on the bottom side that will tell you a little bit about them. Because we thought it might be interesting to find the different life stages of the beetles and, and sometimes, you know, looking at, and so the little stir stick is the, they are the darkling beetle. And so being the darkling beetle, they like to bury themselves. And so you might have to dig around in order. So I'll just start passing them around and you can... So they're work. Live. We have live. Yes, these are all live. And so the beetle, the beautiful bar, part about them is that they truly do not, they, they do not escape. So we utilize vertical farming methods. I kind of put them in different order here, but by the time you get them, you have to read them anyway because they probably get mixed up. We utilize different farming, vertical farming methods. So we have towers that, um, and I'll just have you just go ahead and grab those as you, um, so that way you can. So we utilize vertical towers, and within those towers we have plastic bins. If the sides are slick, like plastic, they cannot crawl out. And so our uh, first um, trays that we have them growing in, they were kind of, we didn't really know how thick they need to be, so we had them being quite thick. Now we have worked with a local manufacturer in Utica, and we have designed trays that are 40% bigger than what we currently are using, and they're about two and a third, or two, about two, two and three fourths, let's say, inches thick. And so that allows us to put more trays in the space, in the tower space. So the mealworms, as you can see, there's different stages. And people think that you know, it's, it's, it's a livestock. And just like any ag product, it takes time to get from point A to point B. And you can get a chicken to, an, uh, like from an egg to a broiler, in about seven weeks. And when you start looking at the, the time frame on this, you will see that actually for us, it's about a 12 to 15 to 16 week process. So very long. So when people say, you know, we want mealworms now, it's like, we can't. We can't provide it to you right now necessarily. We right now have every mealworm spoken for. We have people on a wait list. So we are, our market right now is selling live. And that's what we are doing right now. Eventually, we want to get into the food industry, which obviously that will involve processing them, frozen or drying them. And eventually, my goal is to get into the, um, kind of like the small mammal 
treat industry eventually. Um, you know, this is such a new market that um, it's got a ways to, to go. We recognize that. It's not for everyone. We also recognize that. And so my passion is the food industry. That's really, really where I want to work, um, whether it's with the UNL Food Processing Center or wherever. Um, but we know that that's, that's going to take some time. So the low-hanging fruit is selling them live. So our markets that we're selling them to are as bait. A lot of people love to ice fish with them. Um, your exotic and specialty pets market. So reptiles, lizards, um, like, like your small turtles, hedgehogs, sugar gliders, um, tarantulas, those are kind of the markets that we're selling live to. And the reason why we have the minis in there, which you, they're going to be really hard to find because they really like to burrow down, is that, for example, I went to a business and they had little baby tarantulas in a cup. And they have to feed them some, something that's live because they, they want to prey on something that's alive and fresh. And the minis were the perfect size at one quarter inch for a baby tarantula to grasp and eat. And so we are offering flexible, you know, flexibility in our sizes to people according to the customer segments that we're um, going for. I was fortunate last July I applied for UNL's In Motion Academy for startups. So we applied last July or end of, well, middle, middle of June, got in first part of July. That was an eight week process. And through that eight week process, I had um, interviewed over a hundred customer, customers and found various customer segments. Um, we, we were fortunate then to get into Nmotion's accelerator for startups, which that gave me a great network of people to work with um, to help us you know, kind of guide us and answer questions and we're able to have different speakers come in and talk about this is what you want to consider for your business. So that was very helpful as well. Prior to applying for University of um, Nebraska's in motion, when I was living in Arizona, I actually went with some people and applied for University of Arizona's i program. And so that was for the food side only. So I, with that, had interviewed probably 50 different people from the food side. So I went from food side and then really focused in on the animal side. So one of the things I would say to anyone that is um, looking at a startup is interview customers. Get in there and talk to people and find out what is they want and what they're looking for. I am still conducting interviews. I conducted one um, two weeks ago, one week ago, and I'm hoping to do one again um, next week. I mean, anyone I can get, because I guarantee you, you will learn something that you did not know before. And so I, every person I meet, I'm not kidding you, every person I, I talk to that is, has an interest in this, I learn something else about mealworms and, and, and potential market uses. And so the, the um, it's just almost endless, really, how you can use them. Not only, like I said, for the animal industry, but also for the food industry. So we are trying to ramp up as much as we can. I am the founder. I have two other women who have come and joined me and are co-founders. And so we are a team of three women. We all have strong agricultural backgrounds. Each one of us, we, we compared our graduating classes of high school, you know, 42 versus 34 versus, I think it was eight. And so that tells you, and from Colorado, one's from Colorado originally and from Nebraska. So the other two actually still live on active farms. And so for one of them, we are um, reusing space that was once used for uh, farrowing hogs. And so it's an empty space. It's perfect because it has ceilings about this height. And it, you don't, we don't want 20 foot ceilings because that's a waste of utilities. We have to keep them in very controlled environment. And we underestimated how important that was. 
and that put us behind in our projections already probably about six weeks. And so lesson learned, you need to follow what you read, you know, because you're kind of experimenting how much can you get away with. Well, this Nebraska winter was brutal and cost of heating was expensive. And so we underestimated that it's really important to have it up about 80 degrees and basically about 55 to 60 percent humidity. So it's, it's kind of a little tropical environment for them and they love it. So they are in these trays and within those trays we feed them wheat bran and I have discovered that working with um, ethanol plants they have dry distillers grains that they have mass quantities of and they sell very, very, very reasonable. So they live off of wheat bran, commercially bought wheat bran, and these dry distillers grains. And they, their moisture source, besides the humidity in the air, helps them stay moist and grow, is we feed them sliced potatoes or carrots. And so every few days we slice a potato and put it in there. And it's remarkable, um, you kind of maybe see, saw some potato that was in there with that. You can put a sliced potato in and it's just like, they just mass aggregate to it. And within you know, a day, all that's left, they don't like the skin, they're just like your kid growing up, they don't like to eat the skin. What's left will be the skin. And, and we just kind of look at, we gauge that. It's important that you do not get mold in there. So we don't want to just put a bunch in and you know we tried to monitor how much that is. So right now we are focusing on ramping up as quickly as we can. So the the when the mealworms become pupa, we will separate those because the pupa are really um, kind of fragile and they can't really protect themselves. And because they are fairly high in moisture, the mealworms will kind of end up eating them if we aren't careful. So we have to make sure we separate them out quick enough that um, they are able to turn to beetles. Because just like any farm, you have to have breeding stock. And so we have had to bring in a competitor's mealworms in to help us get our breeding stock in. You know, we'll bring in so many every couple weeks because we want to be able to have a steady supply. So the biggest things we are learning is, number one, you can't control something that's a living organism as much as you like to think you can. And trying to predict inventory has been a little bit of a nightmare because you, know, we, you, you can set your records and say, by all means, they should be ready to harvest in this date. And sometimes some are ready a week before that, some are ready a week after that, and that kind of drives our farmers nuts. So I am in charge of customer development. I do not worry about the production side. I mean, I do, but I'm not in the trenches every day feeding them. The other two gals are in charge of production and operations. And so we are a team that have different strengths. And my strength right now, I think due to being in public education and recruiting, is that I can talk to a brick wall and, and probably find the interesting or the fascinating conversation with that. The other two aren't as comfortable doing that. And they, have, you know, they said, we can't do what you do. Well, one of the gals is a grant writer. So she is very precise with data and analytics. And you know, that is her strength and forte. So she has, you will see that on those um, cups, they had batch numbers on it. So she is keeping track of, because we have to keep track of born on date with these. Because how do we know um, when we have to fulfill an order of 20,000 mealworms, and if we have 100 towers and there's 20 trays in each of those towers, we have to figure out, well, which, which trays and tower are we going to harvest first? So there's not a lot of software out there for tracking. And so one of the things that we have in our bucket list is that I want to develop some type of software system. I reached out to cricket farmers um, who've been in business for 40 years and they have an Excel spreadsheet and that's how they do it and they keep track of 3,000 boxes with crickets, you know, that way. Um, I would like to be able to do somehow computerized where we can be able to keep track of that a little bit easier. Um, and I know what's out there, 
I think I just have to try to access. I don't. I don't need to reinvent the wheel, you know, um, with that. But so that's our bucket list of things that we recognize we're going to have to probably get sooner than later. Um, it is a relatively low capital startup. Uh, the farmers, the the space that they have, it worked nice because they had space that was not being used. And so it made it very um, reasonable for us in order to do that. Uh, unlike like some, like if you were to buy 20 head of cattle, it's a lot different than if you're buying 20,000 mealworms to get going. So I don't know, uh, I, I can. I know I've got a million questions. So let's go ahead and do <laughs> questions and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Yes. Um, can you give me an idea? Um, okay, you say you, Every mealworm you've got is now spoken for, mm -hmm. so that means there's a, definitely a market out there mm -hmm. for them. Um, I guess I'm curious who was filling that need before you guys started, and then how do you ship them? Because I I, mm -hmm. I know you need to keep them alive, and then mm -hmm. can you give me some feel for when you ship product? Are we talking a semi rolls up, or is it much smaller than much that? smaller? Okay. So for the live for the live. People are wanting them anywhere from a count of um, 50 to 5,000 okay, to 10,000. Well, so <laughs> well. I, originally, we had to count to see how much they weigh, okay. and so we counted out so many, and that was Chris's the data person, <laughs> and she counted and she like oh, lost track sometimes had to start over. <laughs> And it's like, oh man, I feel your pain. And so, um, so she counted and then took an average weight. And we then tried to go what is considered like 5% over that. Because I guarantee you, if we have a cup of 500, there'll be someone that counted out and got 498. You know? And so we try to do 5% over that. So they actually ship and, and we deliver them in those containers right there. They have... Um, a lid that has, I don't know if you can see, it's got holes all around the top. Um, they need air supply. And we will put them in a box like this, containers in a box. They also, people that buy the bulk of like 5,000 at a time, they sometimes want them, um, in the summertime, they're very sensitive actually to heat, probably more than cold. And so you had asked, you know, with, with the temperatures in Nebraska, in the winter time, we put hot packs with them when we shipped them. Some people want them shipped in the snake bags. It's kind of like a nylon bag, and they're bulk in a bag. There's a bunch of them in there. Uh, in the summertime, that will not work because their friction of rubbing over each other will actually kill them. I mean, it kind of cooks them, actually. In the summertime, we're coming up on that, we're probably going to have to put ice packs with them when we ship them. And we try, right now, our um, market is kind of with like a two-day shipping area right now. We said, let's focus on that. And so sometimes in the extreme temperatures, they want overnight because they want to make sure that they arrive safely. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay, okay. Yes? Hi, how did, uh, how did they go finding your investors? Well, we are actually bootstrapping it for the most part. Um, we've got through uh, In Motion, Invest Nebraska, and In Motion gave us our first capital injection, and so that's how we knew. But we all kicked in money, and we are, you know, and we just recently got uh, another investor that's family. That, and, but otherwise, we are very, um, you know much watching a budget we really are my um i my next way i want to spend money is to get a person that is a marketing person i have this gal on board she has been involved in the exotic pet world she gets it one of the things that i don't think i underestimated to be quite honest i grew up on a farm and my pets were cows and pigs and dogs and cats um, and so i did not have appreciation for the exotic pet market and actually that market is growing because due to a lot more people renting homes 
And when I moved back, we had a dog and a cat, and I found neither one, neither apartment complex wants dogs and cats. But they will accept something that's in a, you know, a little aquarium or, you know, type of a cage, no problem. So that market is really growing, to be quite honest. And, and I underestimated how much they love their animals. I mean, their love for their animal is no different than the love I had for my pet orphan calf that I raised, you know, is no different. And they will spend lots of money to make sure that, like, just like your dog or cat, you feed them what you think is the best quality of food for them. And so they want high quality protein. A lot of those, a lot of um, like certain geckos, they cannot survive on fruits and vegetables. They need to have protein. And most of them want it live because that's, that's their instinct is to want to eat live. And one thing I didn't mention is that we have basically zero waste. Right now, because the two gals have chickens, we're able to sell our aged out beetles. So the beetles, about six to eight weeks, they are past their prime, their reproductive prime, and they naturally just kind of start to die off. And so we want to keep track of their lifespan, and then we will get rid of them and make sure we have enough beetles on hand. So the, the beetles, actually, chickens love the live beetles. I mean, my, my the, the, uh, partner, Chris, she, when she walks out with a container that looks like beetles, the chickens are just, you know, they can't get over there fast enough. They love them. And so eventually, we see we'll be able to sell our aged out beetles. The larva is the most kind of highly uh, sought after. And then the frass, which I have not talked about. The frass is the fertilizer. And I, I, that's how we collect it. So we have a ways of collecting it that involves no work on our part whatsoever. Unlike other fertilizer where sometimes you have to dry it and like compost, you have to turn it over, you don't have to do anything with that. And so that is another market force that we're just starting to tap into. So the fertilizer, because of, I don't know if you saw the skins, the skins, their exoskeleton, it has chitin in it. And that's why if there, we mentioned uh, like a shellfish allergy like shrimp, can have that little chitin in the shell. So the chitin actually has shown to be um, beneficial to plants to help, um, now, so the fertilizer has a chitin in it and the chitin can help trigger the immune response in plants. I guess it makes it think it's under attack. And so we are actually working um, on a grant with a, I don't, and I'm, I'm not gonna say what it is at this point, but to experiment with chitin um, on their farms to see if it helps their plants um, against uh, certain pathogenic diseases that they battle. And yesterday I, uh, met with a professor at Hastings College, my alma mater, and we're also going to look at um, working with the frass with some plants that we can actually show before and after pictures of the difference. So it's a great fertilizer, and we will be selling that. It's a pound per pound. So for every pound of live mealworms we have, we collect a pound of frass. And so we have been collecting it in five gallon buckets right now. And you know, it's so fine that it, you know. And so that will be a market for us that we will um, hit with e-commerce. Right now, we have had enough success selling business to business that we have not gotten into the e-commerce. We will do that. Um, but right now, we just, like I said, we already have people on a wait list with businesses that to get into e-commerce, we will, get to that next level probably by the end of summer. Two part question, to the e-commerce, have you set any goals or direction for scaling up and how big you see yourself be with this? And the second part of the question is, what regulatory agencies do you end up getting confronted by in terms of the FDA, are there other agencies, good, agricultural? Yeah, good question. So we laid out a, like a one, two, three, five year projection and like I said, we and we we actually are going to start setting down and do uh, an EOS where we can kind of keep track of quarterly goals and yearly goals and see where we are at with that. Um, when to capacity at just so 
we're using half of a fairing barn right now on the one farm up by Lindsay, and the other one is a, a smaller barn up by Junietta. When we, are, when we just have those two facilities filled, we'll be able to produce about almost 600 pounds live a week. And we have access to about 10,000 square feet, should we need it. So, um, and there's other farmers that have shown interest in it for reusing of space. And so I, I have no doubt that we could probably get other contract farmers to work with us when we get to that point. Next question is, we applied for e-permits with the USDA to ship them because they're considered livestock and just like you when you ship a cow across state lines. Um, so, and that was something that was very conflicting. Some people that we talked to said, you don't have to have a permit for mealworms because they're just so all over the place in a way. I mean, my mom called them, oh, mealies? You were raising mealies? You know, so it's something that they grew up with. And so some people said, no, you don't need one. Other people we talked to said, we have a permit. And so we thought, well, right now the FDA and USDA, they aren't quite sure what to, what to think of this insect agriculture industry. And so there's not a lot of guidance in some ways with that. And so we went ahead and applied for permits to ship across state lines. And even though like um, we finally found a link on the USDA website that said that they were exempt, we went ahead and did it in a way because the gal, when we tried to find this out, Amber was the one that was in charge of trying to get permits. I think she got tossed around to eight different USDA people and it took three months before we got an answer that really wasn't an answer. Um, and it was a cricket grower in Louisiana that actually sent us a link and said, here, I think you're okay. So we got that link, we sent it to the USDA person, but we, like I said, we went ahead and filed for them. I think they're good for three years, if I recall. It's free, all it took was time to do it. So well worth it. The FDA controls, so in order to get mealworms into a feed additive for chickens or for fish, they have to go through AFCO approval, which is um, Association of American Feed Control officials, and or go through where they're generally recognized as safe. We have started, Chris went through um, HACCP training in February, which is, and like, and food safety training, um, because we're going to document, you know, how they are raised, what they are fed, and eventually when we process, what that's gonna look like. So processing will involve freezing them, that euthanizes them, and then, um, or, and then eventually like freeze drying them, or baking them, basically roasting them. And so, to answer your question, you know, we work with kind of both USDA and FDA with that. So, you know. You're erring on the caution side, so, but you don't have to back it. Yeah, exactly. We'd rather have it, we'd rather be proactive and have our bases covered than to have someone come back. My biggest fear was um, to have, even though they're common, <coughs> I didn't want something to happen some other state and all fingers point to us in Nebraska. It's like, they are the cause of that, you know? And so I wanted to make sure that even though everyone uses them across the United States, I just would rather be safe than sorry and go that route. So we had to work with both agencies. And first off, congratulations on your great Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. That was that was totally unexpected. I can tell you that. So, we that started off because we were invited, and Hastings Museum had a spirits and and interesting people, and we it's called SIP, and we celebrated that because we thought we're no longer weird. We're now interesting, you know. <laughs> and so we went to that, and a Tribune person was yeah. there, and he. Um, asked if he could interview us for an egg section, and so we said yes, and so we did that, and then one thing led to another, so, you know, very much a surprise with that. But, you know, our, our big goal, you know, we don't know, you don't know what you don't know. What we do know is that the food industry is still, you know, how many of you, you know, held back from eating, and there's still a cringe factor. And so we recognize that, so we are dedicating you know, right now, 100% to the animal. Eventually, I see Chris's farm being food, Amber's farm being the animal side. And so, which would be probably like a two-thirds, one-third situation. 
So when I, just a little bit what I did for customer development or customer, I went to, um, it was about a year ago, uh, to Georgia to a Research Chefs Association conference. And the, because I was new on the block, there's other people have been raising insects for food, did a panel. And they were hoping to have maybe 15 to 20 chefs show up. And the room was filled with like 120. And so they recognize that the edible insect market is coming and, um, and they want to be prepared because they need to teach their students how to cook with insects. And so that was very encouraging. And then um, later in August, I went to Eating Insect Athens in Athens, Georgia conference. And they had a wonderful chef, um, Brooklyn, Joseph Yoon Brooklyn, from Brooklyn Bugs, made all these different dishes. It's about, I think it was seven, eight course um, appetizers. And all had insects in it. And it was delicious, I can tell you that. There wasn't anything I didn't eat, and everything was like snarfed up by people. There was nothing left. I mean, people could have eaten more, to be quite honest. So, you know, there's a saying with our industry now that we've kind of picked up on is, don't yuck my yum. <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, for other people around the world, eating insects is yeah. so common that they don't think twice about it. We have kind of, we're slow to, you know, we've got access to such other great quality of meats that we have not, you know, really considered that for whatever reason. So we are behind. But I think that you're going to see more and more of it. Um, there's companies out there already using cricket protein a lot. And so they um, are looking at crossing over into using mealworm protein at this point to just kind of give them other avenues, other flavors to go with. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, a dried mealworm um, is about 55% protein, and 26% 20, fat, and like 8% fiber. So its nutrition profile is very similar to beef, actually. And um, so you have people who are wanting to, you know, incorporate other sources of protein or for their use. You know, it, and what is different is that it's, it's soy free, it's dairy free, and so for certain people not wanting to have whey products or, and, it, and it's a complete protein because it is an animal, it has a complete protein with, um, you know, fatty acids, omega fatty acids. So, you know, I, I don't know the fat, how, if, how that collects, uh, if that becomes cholesterol or not, but the, the, yeah, they're 26% fat. So that creates a little bit of an issue when you go to mill. In fact, people actually get mealworm oil. I'm not sure what they use, but they can actually squeeze out and get oil from them. So Stanford, I believe is, I think it was Stanford, California, they actually did research and mealworms were able to <coughs> digest styrofoam and eat, eat that. So they will they'll eat about anything. Um, I would not want to eat necessarily a mealworm that has had that, but supposedly I think they said there was, they did not pick up where it, it had ingested any, or where it held any type of chemicals, supposedly, I guess. Um, but, you know, they will eat about anything you put in front of them. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, I noticed your leadership is all female. Was that intentional? Yes, yeah, it was. Um, it did, well, Chris, I knew from a long time ago with grants. So she, we worked on an SBIR grant and she helped me get a grant when I was a public school teacher. And so she was actually, had started kind of experimenting growing mealworms um, because uh, Bug Eater was talking about using mealworms. And so she, they, she thought, well, I'm gonna kind of experiment and kind of learn along the way. So she had that. And then I, after that we added, Amber, um, she came highly recommended to us from the Engler program at UNL. I reached out to them. And I just feel that at where my vision was, it's just a compelling story to have three women in agriculture. You don't typically see three women necessarily in agriculture and being something unique. Um, down the road, I don't know what will, ha will happen. We all will take on. We always said 
we would try to take on um, strategic investors. You know, it's kind of what can they bring to the table to help us at this point. Um, but it is a it is an industry that I think you're going to see more and more growing. Is there a lot of mealworm farms? There are across the United States. From what we can tell, and actually I'm, I'm a member of North American Coalition of Insect Agriculture, and one of the things we're going to actually do is get data and find out how many farms there are out there. I think from what we can tell as far as kind of bigger ones, about a dozen maybe. So not that, a lot. Oh, I'm sorry. For that question also, what's, what's your greatest competition if you have it? People who have been established for 40 years. So it hasn't been around that long. Yes, um, West Coast, California, and then some like Georgia, Louisiana. Um, but most of the ones out east, I think, were kind of crickets that farmers that also added mealworms um, to their to their products. So right now, we've been asked if we would expand and grow different like different species of mealworms or um, roaches, dubia roaches, or crickets. Right now, we want to do one thing well, <laughs> and um, my vision is everything mealworms. It's kind of what I, and so I want to, I think, feel like we have enough of what we can get into right now that I don't want to go down other rabbit holes with things. So have you contacted- Last like, question, by the way. Oh. <laughs> have, you, have you contracted or contacted like a health food, like local, because there's a lot of startups locally, to use those in their products because at this point in time, you are not doing it. Right. Selling it to them. Right, right. So, and actually, we are not selling anything for the food industry right now. Everything's live. So, I have talked to um, people who are interested in pairing up with me and developing these products. Um, right now, that's going to take money to do. And right now, like I said, we're using all of our income to go right back into um, growing more and growing bigger more trays and so that is probably something we see at least probably being maybe a year maybe a year down the road we really will look at that seriously with the food but right now but I have continued to cultivate those relationships all right well thank you very much Cheryl oh, thank you before we have you wrap up I want you to describe that I read the article it was a great article and I think I included a link in our newsletter, so you might want to read it. Can you describe when you go into their production room and it's dead quiet, what do you hear? <laughs> <laughs> so the exoskeleton on them leaves them to have a little bit of a rough surface. And you can actually hear them like <sighs> as they roll over each other. That's the best way to describe it. In fact, there's a YouTube link that you can that someone actually took a microphone and put it in a tray, and you can hear, and that's exactly the way it is. And it's a little bit, um, it can be a little kind of, yeah, yeah, a little bit. But like they usually have music playing when they're in there working, and um, our our mealworms are quite educated because they listen to a lot of podcasts <laughs> and different course, types Very of music. Cool. And I also want everybody to exert a little peer pressure on Brooke who came in a little late, but I want Brooke to try some mealworms, so make sure. I need peer pressure, I'll do it. Okay. Anyway, Cheryl, thank you for being here. Oh, We'd like you. to give you a Focus Suite mug as, thank a, you. as a thank you for being here. Um, we appreciate your time and uh, you. your mealworms. Thank and you so we'll much. be anxious to follow your progress in the future. Yeah. Um, Everybody that's here, please come up and ask Cheryl more questions if you have them. Hang around, visit with one another, exchange those business cards, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you for coming. I was afraid there'd be, like the old saying, crickets in the room chirping. <laughs> <laughs> so I was glad that you're here. And I don't know if with the fertilizer, I don't know if you actually like smelled it, but if you notice, it's odorless, which makes it great for indoor or outdoor plants. How do you, how do you separate, separate that from the worms and then also the, the skeletons. How do you, I mean, you got a whole tray of these. Right. How do you get that? So out? with the skeleton, we carefully kind of run a vacuum over it. So we're collecting all the chitin. We don't know what, like with these skeletons that doesn't already get into the frass, we collect that. Um, we're just collecting it because we aren't sure 
what that could possibly be used for. But okay. I said, don't throw it away. We don't know yet. And um, with the, otherwise with the frass, we have trays that actually um, separates okay. and collects. So, so filters it out. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can tell you this, you know, people talk, I talked to a couple people back there about, they, they have a view of worms being dirty and I can tell you their living space is cleaner than probably any commercial space that you have cattle, hogs, or chickens growing in, to be quite honest. It really is. It's a very clean. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You bet.